Um, we've got one question here. Have the discussions around food security changed due to the pandemic? Oh, yes, and certainly they have. Um, we at the NFU have uh, been talking about how we should kind of redesign our food system to deal with the problems that have become apparent uh, as a result of the uh, pandemic, more apparent than, than they were before. They certainly uh, they existed things like uh, um, poor working conditions, and low wages for um, migrant farm workers in the food processing plants and on some of the farms. Um, also, how does the way our food system interact with nature actually produce and promote uh, the kind of new uh, infections that can cause a pandemic. And, and maybe we should look at changing, uh, not just maybe, we really do need to look at changing how our uh, uh, food system operates to have uh, better boundaries between the natural areas and the commercial food system and probably relocalize and have more uh, of our food produced in uh, um, areas that are closer to home and not relying on this global interchange of, of um, it's not just, uh, you know, we're really, really connected and we, uh, we can get kiwi fruit in uh, the middle of winter and, and enjoy it. But those same trade connections are also pathways for, um, for the um, disease organisms if they start getting into our, into our um, um, populations. So there's a lot of things to talk about about the pandemic and the food system, that's for sure. Okay. Uh, next question. There is a question about reviewing the slide listing the interests of public and private seed from your presentation, Kathy. Would you like to take that now or do some of the others and then come back? I can bring it up on the screen share. Um, um, want to discuss sure, it? whatever you think, if, uh, you can see the questions. So I, I don't know what else is up there lined up. So. Um, let's circle back to it then. We'll move on and do some of the other questions just in case there's some for Axel to weigh in on as well. Um, next question, does flax or straw have potential for making paper? <laughs> oh yes, yeah. Yes. Uh, 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 I think in particular good for making paper for rolling cigarettes, uh, which is maybe... <laughs> but, Excellent, uh, rolling paper. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but, you know, the fiber as such, or the, the fiber use, um, or the, for technical purposes, it can, can also be used. It mustn't be necessarily for paper, but of course you can also make paper for, you can make high quality paper actually from it, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, next question. Why can't Ag Canada release hairy canola seed directly to farmers? Mm. That is a very good question. And this has to do with how um, the, um, I guess, the Ag Canada has kind of made a decision over the past um, maybe several decades that, that its role is to do the research, but not to commercialize. They don't uh, they don't, um, it, with canola anyways, they, they don't finish varieties. Uh, we do have uh, varieties that are finished and commercialized at, um, in cereal crops, but not in, uh, not in canola. So I, it's, not, it's not something that they're completely incapable of doing. There's no reason why they couldn't have a different decision and say that uh, it is a, a good idea for Ag Canada to uh, finish varieties and make them available. But it's, it's been a, I guess, a, a decision to divide the work that way. And that allows the uh, uh, private seed sector that is, um, you know, interested in, in, um, uh, using seed as a way to increase their wealth, um, it gives them almost a monopoly or does in effect give them a, a monopoly on deciding what kinds of um, uh, varieties are, are brought to market and, and which ones are, are left uh, you know, 
on the shelf. Related, are there things that Canadians can do to make sure farmers have access to hairy canola and other plants with, with benefits, similar benefits? Well, you know, I guess it's, there needs, there's a, a missing step, you know, the germplasm is there both genetically engineered and uh, non-transgenic. Uh, it requires a step of somebody um, uh, turning, taking that and, and making it into a variety that meets the requirements for variety registration and uh, being willing to take it to market. And so that step is missing. We could be, we could demand, uh, put pressure on, on government to um, make that part of their work instead of saying it's somebody else's job. Um, I, I, I don't know, maybe Axel has some ideas about how that might, might be possible. That uh, I, I guess, you know, if, if there isn't seem to be any concern about how things are, they won't change. So, so raising awareness, that's why I tell this story. I want people to know about it so that we can pressure government to, to change uh, this uh, type of, um, uh, you know, lack of, lack of taking the, the plant breeding right to the, to the last stage to make public varieties directly available to farmers for, for use. Okay, next we've got, uh... This one's a comment and it's a two part question. Uh, I enjoy the participatory trial in Canovi offered through Bauta. Sorry if I got those wrong. Um, and agree that seed banks are important. However, should we not see more adaptation works being done in varying climate? Also with the interest in native plant species, do you not see issues about commercialization and having these important foods still available the indigenous communities that rely on them. So that's sort of two different things, but they came from the same questioner. So attack where you would, <laughs> whatever you want to speak to in that. Maybe I uh, speak briefly. Uh, it is very clear that we as a, 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 the gene bank here, this is just uh, an emergency measure. Zach. It's probably a good idea uh, uh, to have a place where you can preserve this diversity as by keeping options open. You may have many things we have would have been lost otherwise, that's for sure. But it cannot be a purpose. Uh, it's not the final purpose, right? Uh, uh, these things are meant to be utilized or, or, or to put put to put to use, right? For 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 people. This is why this, uh, how this diversity came about. And, uh, and there, of course, uh, that relates maybe a little bit to the talk of Katie also. It, the, the consumer is powerful, right? The decisions the consumers make, they, uh, they impact also what is there, for sure. Uh, so this is maybe all I want to say for, to, for that aspect there. Then there is a question, uh, there was this other question about the indigenous. Uh, also, uh, with the interest in native plant species, do you not see issues about commercialization and having these important foods still available to the indigenous communities that rely on them, if they? Oh, definitely, they should be available. Uh, I think, uh, I think uh, there can be positive uh, interaction we wouldn't take anything from anybody, right? Uh, uh, our, as a gene bank, our purpose is only to work like a library and it will be, it's in the public domain. What we have, there's no, no exclusive rights uh, on it. So anybody uh, uh, has access to it. Uh, and this is also, to, this is also regulated as part of this uh, international treaty on plant genetic resources for food and agriculture under which conditions things are exchanged. And the issues around indigenous people and rights, uh, they are also a part of this uh, big treaty. But I think uh, the, the real action counts uh, and not if 
paper on uh, a treaty on paper so, uh, there are, there i think there's a lot of uh, opportunities also to maybe redetect things or uh, revive things uh, and that mustn't be our task as a gene bank as such but it's very interesting to see and there are things happening which give opportunities also to those uh, engaging in these uh, uh, special uses uh, based on, on uh, traditions. Uh, so I see there's quite some opportunities there. Yeah, and maybe I'll just add a little bit uh, related to that. Uh, the UN International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture also has some uh, uh, stipulations about how, uh, how plant material is, is should be used. I, I guess you were you were saying that, Axel. Um, and it's an area that is very, you know, it's a highly contested area because of the idea of bio, bio piracy, which might be corporations saying, oh, gee, that looks like it might really, you know, we could put that into our breeding program and, you know, patent it or, you know, have, take control over it and say, hey, we, we created this new uh, new um, plant variety, and so now it's ours, and we can make you pay if you want to use it. And like, oh well, maybe we'll pay a little bit of a royalty to the ind indigenous community that identified it. But you know, uh, there's definitely people that say no; it just does not. You you can't you can't uh, take that. You can't own it. You can't use it. And and then there's some that might say, well. You know, it's a source of money. Maybe we should, but uh, it's a pretty highly contested area, and uh, I haven't read a lot about it recently. But several years ago, it was a pretty hot topic. I'm not sure where things stand right now, but uh, I, you know, I think um, Indigenous people need to be in charge of uh, Indigenous. Um, food and and the use of it and 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 uh, um, they definitely it should not be um, kind of enclosed and privatized well spoke <laughs> this is a very interesting question i was curious about that one um kathy what is happening to the number of farms these days <laughs> Uh, well, um, farms are getting bigger and uh, there's fewer farmers. Um, there's a long-term trend uh, of, um, you know, get bigger, get out. Uh, although, um, you know, this has, has a lot to do with um, how much money the big corporations like the ones that are controlling seed and selling chemicals and fertilizers they're able to uh, extract quite a lot of the value out of the um, products that farmers use and there's a lot of debt and you know the economic situation isn't great maybe banks are a little bit more uh, willing to work with a larger farmer than the smaller ones um, you know there's a lot of things that happen that are making it uh, harder for uh, farmers to stay in business. But uh, one of the things that the NFU really works on is trying to reverse that. Uh, we feel like the federal government likes to have as a, well, I would say their key performance in, in indicator for agriculture is the uh, billions of dollars of exports, growth in exports. And our key performance in indicators are the number of farmers and the average age of farmers. So we want a higher number of farmers and a lower average age because we need young farmers to take over farms and to you know, carry on the, take the knowledge forward to pass on what they know and, and to create and to bring about that next generation of family farmers. Follow up to that. Are people going into farming considering the decreasing number of farms from what you know? Oh, there's still definitely people going into farming. Uh, there's just not enough of them. When we look at the statistics of uh, age group, like the Census of Canada, Agriculture Census uh, divides farmers into three age groups. Uh, and the youngest age group 
is is pretty you know it's 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 not enough to uh, replace the older farmers that are are going to be retiring and dying. So uh, we need to increase the number of small farmers or younger farmers. And younger farmers often need to start on, on our smaller farms because they can't uh, get the kind of financing together to, and they don't know enough, they wanna start small and grow rather than start big and you know be in a pretty risky situation. So uh, that's a big area of policy that the NFU is really concerned about is, uh, helping younger farmers uh, get into farming and to succeed so that they can farm for their lives. And, and that we, we do have that intergenerational transfer of land and knowledge and culture. Um, before we get to, well, the next question is, can you talk about Jerusalem artichoke cultivars? Oh, I, can, I can talk about <laughs> Right. Because we have a large collection, we have we have about 175 uh, lines of Jerusalem artichoke. It's probably one of the largest. Uh, well, it's sec maybe the second largest collection in the world, and we maintain it here in Saskatoon. It's in the field now. They are frozen. Uh, uh, they are frozen in the ground. You would need uh, uh, dynamite, dynamite <laughs> to get. <laughs> to get some out. Uh, uh, they are pretty, pretty winter hardy. That we have had so, but it was maybe more to diseases that we lost than to, uh, to the frost. Uh. So yes, we have a big collection here and they are very uh, diverse. And it's a very interesting crop because it is, uh, it's kind of native, uh, definitely native to North America. Whether it's native to Canada is a little bit disputed. It's for sure naturalized in Canada. It was used by the First Nations people also. Very interesting features. Uh, it's extremely door tolerant, uh, low input. Uh, it's kind of semi-domesticated. Uh, maybe it was used as an emergency food also by the uh, First Nations people. And as an emergency food, it always appeared in Europe also during times of crisis and war. Suddenly, mm -hmm. Jerusalem artichoke became uh, of interest. Uh, so, uh, uh, yes, it's an interesting. And then it's also a relative of sunflower. So it could be used in sunflower breeding. My friend bought a house and discovered one growing in, between, in, her, in her plot and had no idea what it was. And then she was quickly informed that. And they will stay forever, you know. Stay yeah. forever. <laughs> <laughs> um, this one going back to Kathy, is farmland remaining as farmland considering land price speculation? Hmm. <laughs> Sounds like we should have a sustainability series talk on, on land issues. Um, uh, I'm not quite sure what the question is getting at, but there, uh, one of the things that's partly driving land price rise is farmland, companies that are set up as farmland investment companies, uh, they get money from, in, in Saskatchewan, foreign ownership is not allowed. So farmland investment company investors have to be Canadian investors, but they can put their money in and it, it's a pool of money that, uh, you know, it's not based on the productivity of the land, but it's more based on the speculation. Like, oh, we'll put our money in for a while. Some of this is are RSP eligible, so they get a tax break and they collect rent from the farmers that they're renting the land from, so they get an annual income. And then when they sell the land, they can make money off of it if the price goes up. So some of these farmland investment companies are helping to increase the price of land. And another thing is farmers, when the price of uh, your crop is low, you need to, and you need to make a certain amount of money to, to get by, you can make up in low, for low prices with a higher amount of product that you have to sell. So you can do that by increasing the yield on the land you have. Another way to do that is increase the amount of land that you're farming. So you have a higher volume of crop to sell. 
And if interest rates are um, such that it, it you know, is, is doable, you might take that risk. Uh, it is risky. Uh, so um, I don't hear much about land being abandoned because nobody can afford to buy it. I think if a seller really wants to sell it, they'll, they'll make a deal with somebody. But, uh, and then there's a situation of land around closer to cities where developers might want to hold on to it and sell it to, uh, or land speculators might want to sell it to a developer for urban expansion. That's kind of another whole area of, of concern around farmland loss. But I don't think we're having farmland abandoned because it's too high priced. I'm gonna, uh... We can continue some of the question and answer, but I wanna make sure that we get Carol in here before the end. So Carol, do you have a few things to add before we come to the end of the program? 